What does it mean in your own personal spiritual life to choose life? What does it mean in the life of the church, your church, to choose life? What does it mean for us as an annual conference to choose life? What does it mean for the general church to choose life? What does it mean at every level of faithfulness to choose life? life is to let go of any baggage that's keeping us back, no matter how valuable that seems to us. are, I set before you life and death, choose life. Be willing to give up everything to go where God leads. And so I ask again, what do we need to let go of in order to choose life? What personal and congregational baggage and keepsakes is Christ calling us to leave today so that we might follow him more closely as his faithful disciples. Jesus makes those same demands to us today individually, I believe. Mark describes Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee, seeing Peter and Andrew fishing, and Jesus says, come with me. I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. You can fish for men and women instead of perch and bass. And Mark reports the rest of it this way. He says, they didn't ask questions. They dropped their nets and followed Jesus. In the water, God's gonna trouble the water. Well, if you don't believe I've been reading. We celebrate our gathering as we celebrate water collected, protected, consumed, except for tonight. Tonight we celebrate water poured out, released, never to be recollected, never to be reused. Paul writes to the Philippians, even now, I am being poured out like a drink offering. He's referring to that Jewish practice of a daily offering of meat and grain and a quart of wine, poured out over the sacrifice, never to be recollected, never to be reused, poured out, wasted. Twice, Paul uses this phrase, I am being poured out like a drink offering, and both times he finds himself imprisoned, stuck there, unable to reach out, unable to, to do anything, unable to get out and to teach and to preach and to travel. And Paul knows his time is winding down, never to be recollected, never to be reused, poured out, wasted. If we are longing for new life, if we are longing for the Spirit of God to come upon us again, then I ask us this morning, not simply to ask, but in our hearts, beg, plead, anything that we can do in our being to say, God, we believe that you have more for us still. We have messed up, but thank God you are in the business of dealing with messed up folks, because <laughs> that's us. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We confess that our lives of discipleship... We have failed. 
to be an obedient church. Lives and statistics do not lie. We confess that we have not done your will. We confess that we have worshipped We have you. broken your law. We confess that in the past we have placed... We have rebelled against your love. We confess we are more often... We have not loved our neighbors. We confess we have moved... And we have not heard the cry of the needy. We confess the voices of disgruntled... So Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, we pray. I am a part of a lost generation, and I refuse to believe that I can change the world. But I can change the world, and I refuse to believe that I'm part of a lost generation. And money will make me happy. I will tell my children, money will make me happy is a lie, and happiness comes from within. In the future, environmental destruction will be the norm. It will be evident that my peers and I care about this earth. I will tell my children, they're not the most important thing in my life. Families stayed together once upon a time. Family is more important than work. This is a quick fix society. But this will not be true in my era. 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. I do not concede that 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. It will be evident that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It is foolish to presume that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. There is hope. Well, we consider these leadership revivals, and our church is really committed to wanting to see the United Methodist Church have a future with hope. So we take all of our best ideas and all the stories that might inspire people, and, and the thought is every year I go to five or six conferences, and if I can help those conferences have a few tools to help them be more effective, and then also inspire them to remember what's great about being United Methodist, and, and then the call of Christ for us to reach out to our communities. If I leave and they feel energized and inspired and go back to their local churches ready to help renew their church and reach outside their walls, we consider it a success. So that's the idea is take, I do three 90 minute sessions, one on leadership, one on preaching and worship, and one on missional outreach. And then I share those in every one of the annual conferences and our hope is that hopefully that'll make a difference in, in churches' lives. I am still a Christian today because there was a United Methodist Church out there that reminded me, that really helped me see an approach to the gospel that was so compelling I would give my life to it. So let me just remind you, United Methodists, we're somewhere between this and this. Actually, we're a bridge that holds these things together. So, so what I would tell you is this. Here's, here's why the world needs a United Methodist approach to the gospel and why this approach really speaks to 21st century young people. We are a church that believes in both grace and holiness. God isn't waiting to stomp us into hell. God is a God of grace and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and God also calls us to live a life worthy of the calling with which we've been called. And if you have holiness without grace, you have legalism. If you have grace without holiness, you have cheap grace. But when you hold them together, you have something powerful and compelling. Uh, people ask me this question, Adam, are you liberal or conservative? My answer is always the same. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> no, 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 no. You have to be one or the other. Why do I have to be one or the other? To be liberal means to be open to reform, willing to rethink, to see ideas in fresh ways, generous of spirit. All of those are dictionary definitions of, of being liberal. To be conservative means you hold on to the treasures of the past and you don't throw them away just because they're not in style anymore. If you're conservative without being liberal, then you're narrow-minded and stuck. If you're, if you're liberal without being conservative, then you're, then you're just out there drifting. But when you hold those two together, you have a powerful truth, a whole truth. <clears throat> we believe in the evangelical gospel and the social gospel. Guess what? We are evangelicals, not the way evangelicalism has been defined in the last 30 or 40 years. I have people tell me, uh, you know, well, Hamilton's not really an evangelical. He's a United Methodist. Guess what? Who do you think invented the 18th century evangelical revival? <laughs> we believe in the evangelical gospel and the social gospel. The evangelical, evangelical gospel says that there's something inside of us that's dreadfully wrong, and it steers us in the wrong direction, and we need help. We need to be changed from the inside out. And God's antidote to that was Jesus Christ, who came to call us to the new birth, the new life, transformation by the Holy Spirit, a relationship with Christ that offers us grace and mercy, and then calls us every day to walk with him and to follow him. And we believe in the social gospel, which says that God cares about what's happening in the world, and when he wants to change it and bring justice and mercy, he calls the church to be that. So if we have the social gospel without the evangelical gospel, we have the form of godliness. It looks godly, but it doesn't have the power to change anything. When we have the evangelical gospel without the social gospel, we have spiritual narcissism. It's all about me and Jesus, and who cares about anybody else? But when you have the evangelical gospel and the social gospel, you have a whole gospel. And guess what? All of what I just taught you? is United Methodism 101. And so I want to invite you, I'm going to end with this. 
The world needs vibrant, vital United Methodist churches in the Susquehanna Annual Conference. You have the potential to change the world. You're going to see continued decline for the next 15 years because we have a lot of people who will die before we see things turn around. But 15 years from now, if you do everything right today, you're going to start to see the Susquehanna Annual Conference reaching new people for Christ. You've been reaching them for some time. You're going to see young people who are today in seventh grade leading your churches into a future with hope. And my hope and prayer is that you will be, you will see and witness, and today you're laying the seeds for the great 21st century evangelical revival of the United Methodist Church. And if that happens, we have a great future with hope. So, my beloved sisters and brothers, the journey continues. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We are now offering you so very many resources, and you can access them on our website as we continue to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, as we continue to see ourselves as newly emboldened as God's people, the Susquehanna Conference of the United Methodist Church.